Amen. This is a third century synagogue in Capernaum. The foundation where the arrow points is the foundation of the synagogue where Jesus would have been doing this teaching today. Just something of interest. So suppose 50 people left the church, quit the church entirely today because of my teaching. Would that reflect badly on me? What if 100 people quit the church? Would you think less of me for tearing the church apart? What if almost everybody quit? What if next week there were just a handful of us here? Would that be bad? Depends on what I was teaching, right? Today, as you know, we're going to see Jesus teach something that is so difficult for the disciples to swallow that most of them stopped following him. And at the end of the passage, he turns to his 12 apostles. The video throws Mary in there. You know, you always got to have the, the femme fatale or the ingenue or whatever. He turns to the 12 apostles and he asks them, do you want to leave too? Before we see what happens, let's try to remember where we are in our narrative. You can open your Bible if you want to John chapter 6, verse 41. Jesus miraculously fed thousands of people, and this caused many of them to believe that he was the great prophet Moses had said would come. And then they began asking him for an even greater sign to validate that he was a greater prophet than Moses. But Jesus admonished them. He said their excitement was due to being well fed because they'd received physical, temporal blessings not because they understood the significance of the miracle. And he said, rather than seeking perishable food, they should be seeking eternal food that could sustain eternal life. And then Jesus told them that he was the bread of life sent by God to give life to the world. We finished last time, this is two weeks ago, with Jesus teaching that God would send people to him, and those people would come to faith in Jesus and have their salvation guaranteed forever. Now, the dialogue we studied last time could have taken place anywhere in Capernaum, probably out by the shore. But the dialogue today most certainly takes place in the synagogue, as we'll see in verse 59. So let's begin in verse 41. Got to turn it up. John 6, 41, then the Jews who were hostile to Jesus began complaining about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Now, most translations in verse 41 say the Jews who were murmuring against Jesus. Remember, John sometimes uses that phrase to refer to the Jewish religious leaders and surely the religious leaders were gathered in the synagogue to discuss what Jesus was teaching the crowd. And they were troubled by this teaching that he had come down from heaven. They knew his family. He was from Heston or Augusta, okay? Nazareth was only 30 miles from Capernaum. How could he say that he had come down from heaven? Verse 43, Jesus replied to them, do not complain about me to one another. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who hears and learns from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Last week, Two weeks ago, sorry. We heard Jesus say that everyone whom God the Father chose would come to faith in Jesus. And we see this repeated here in verse 45 where Jesus says, everyone who hears and learns from the Father will come to him. But now Jesus also says in verse 44 that no one can come to faith in Jesus unless God the Father draws them. Together, these ideas are what we call election 
As we have learned earlier in our study of this gospel, we all are born with a corruption in our human nature. And this corruption began way back in the beginning when Adam and Eve, the first people, first turned away from God and sinned. They experienced a corruption in their nature, their human essence. And that corruption has been passed down through all the generations, and every one of us in this room has inherited that corruption from our parents. And because of this corruption, we cannot discern spiritual things accurately. Now, people often boast, at least to themselves, about how wise, how discerning, how street smart they are. But when it comes to understanding things like the depth of our sinfulness, the absolute purity of God, the way God sees things in black and white instead of shades of gray, the need to put our faith in Jesus, the way of salvation. When it comes to spiritual issues like these, our corrupted nature prevents us from understanding, from discerning clearly, unless God helps us. John has shared with us various teachings by Jesus that make it clear that God the Father chooses someone by grace, and that chosen person is enlightened by God such that she or he comes to understand the need for a personal Savior and eventually comes to believe in Jesus as that personal Savior. And in this process, the Holy Spirit regenerates that person spiritually and identifies him or her forever with Christ. Now Jesus rounds out this teaching by saying that nobody can come to faith in Him unless they are chosen by God to go through this process of being enlightened and regenerated. Now, not all Christians believe in election. We could say not all the elect believe in election. It's clearly stated here in John and in other places in the Bible but many believers find it unpalatable because they cannot accept that God would determine that some people could not go to heaven. But there are two mistakes in that reasoning. First, saying that God specifies that a person, a specific person, cannot go to heaven misses the point entirely. Okay, it's the wrong perspective. Because we all have the guilt of rebellion against God because we all have that corruption in our human nature, because every day we have turned away from God repeatedly to pursue sin instead of Him, none of us, none of us deserve to go to heaven. The miracle is that God chooses to save any of us. The miracle that He didn't wipe out every person in Noah's Ark, that He saved, what was it, eight? Well, he saves more than eight, but he doesn't save all. Second, even if you believe that everyone should or does have the same opportunity to put their faith in Jesus, it still would be the fact that God, who is omniscient, who knows everything, that God knew who would come to saving faith and who would not when he chose this specific path for the universe to take out of the infinite array of paths he could have chosen. God chose this route, this path, this timeline for the universe, knowing exactly on that timeline who would accept Jesus and who would not. And so God is still deterministic in who goes to heaven and who does not. So we do believe in election, that nobody deserves salvation. But God chooses to save some, and those people come to faith in Jesus, while others do not. Now, Jesus quoted from Isaiah 54, verse 13. That's what's underlined in the slide. This prophecy was about the restored Jerusalem after the exile, when God himself would teach all the people. Jesus' use of this prophecy implies that believers are children of God's kingdom that we are partially experiencing the prophesied New Testament or New Covenant promises. Verse 47. 
Jesus continues. He says, I tell you the solemn truth. This is amen, amen, truly, truly. The way we have seen, Jesus begins some of his most important statements. I tell you the solemn truth. The one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that has come down from heaven so that a person may eat from it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, most of this is very similar to what we heard two weeks ago. So if you want to know more about these ideas Jesus is explaining here, I encourage you to go listen to the sermon from two weeks ago or get the devotion. They're available on our website. Previously, Jesus was speaking to the crowd in Capernaum, probably by the shore. But now he knows the religious leaders are in the synagogue and they're murmuring against him. They're grumbling about him. And so he goes in there and he explains the same concepts to them. And it's so ironic. We talked two weeks ago about how the people, hoping that Jesus would politically deliver them just as Moses had delivered the people, asked for a sign immediately after Jesus had miraculously fed thousands of people, which had made them think of Jesus as the prophet Moses had promised in the first place. And now, the religious leaders who practically worship Moses and who diligently study Moses and the prophets all the time continuously reject the identity of Jesus despite his miraculous signs and his teachings, which verify his identity from Scripture. Jesus is the living bread or it could be translated life-giving bread. Jesus is the eternal bread, which can sustain eternal life. Even Moses couldn't offer eternal bread. The people wanted a sign to prove that Jesus was greater than Moses, but instead of another miracle, Jesus offers them this truth. If someone comes to Jesus and believes in Jesus, then she or he will have eternal life. The one new teaching here is Jesus specifically saying that the eternal life-giving bread is his flesh. But before we go on and see what kind of havoc that causes, let's note that we are talking about the divine Son of God here, right? We believe in one God, but he's revealed himself to be triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So this is the divine Son of God who came and took on human flesh. We call that the incarnation, God taking on human flesh. It's what we celebrate at Christmas every year. In verse 52, the religious leaders were not celebrating. It says, Then the Jews who were hostile to Jesus began to argue with one another, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth, amen, amen, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, Jesus had said before that he was the bread of life, and it hadn't really bothered the religious leaders. They were more worried about the fact that he said he came down from heaven. But now Jesus gets more graphic, and he says not only that he is the bread of life, but that the bread specifically is his flesh. And this upsets the religious leaders. Now they're probably aware he's not promoting cannibalism, but they don't like his metaphor, and they don't understand it. If we are going to understand what Jesus is saying here, we're going to have to remember what we learned two weeks ago and a little earlier in this gospel. First of all, one reason the Son of God came in the flesh was to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. When Jesus allowed himself to be crucified on the cross, he took the penalty for all the sin of the world for all time. He sacrificed his flesh. He spilled his blood so that he could save us. Second, in verse 40, Jesus said, for this is the will of my Father, for everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him to have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. 
Now in verse 54, he says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So to eat his flesh, to drink his blood, is to believe in him. It is to believe in his identity as the Son of God who has come in human flesh and to accept his sacrifice as the one that saves you, that makes you right with God. We can get some more enlightenment from another comparison. Verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never go hungry, and the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. And now in verse 51, he says, if anyone would eat this bread, his flesh, he will live into eternity. So if to eat Jesus' flesh is to come and believe in him, then to not hunger, to not thirst, is to live with God into eternity. It is to lack nothing spiritually. They're parallel ideas. Now, this passage we're studying is not about our ordinance or sacrament of communion, but it is, communion is, a remembrance of what Jesus is discussing here, his sacrifice. He died to make salvation possible for us. All that God requires of us is that we believe in who Jesus is and what He has done for us. Verse 56. This is still Jesus talking. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father so the one who consumes me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It's not like the bread your ancestors ate but then later died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. One more comparison for you. In verse 54, Jesus said, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, in verse 56, he says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood resides in me, and I in him. So again, parallel thoughts. Residing in Christ and having him reside in you must be related to having eternal life. This is about our relationship with Jesus. You remain or reside in Jesus by continually coming and believing in him, by willingly identifying with him, even if it costs you in the world and thus experiencing saving faith and the spiritual transformation that allows you to be more like Him. Jesus remains or resides in you by sacrificially identifying with you so that He can bless you and help you, so that He can give you true and eternal spiritual life. We saw before that Jesus has life in him because that was God the Father's will. So Jesus can impart life to others, both physical life and spiritual life. And thus, if we remain in him and he in us, we can have life and have it eternally. He is the eternal bread which sustains eternal life. Verse 60. Then many of his disciples, when they heard these things, said, this is a difficult saying. Who can hear it or who can understand it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining about this, so he said to them, does this cause you to be offended? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? When the disciples complained about this being a difficult saying, they weren't stressing its deepness or its complexity. They were saying how unpleasant, how harsh it was. The Greek word skleros indicates that. And part of the problem was Jesus was teaching in metaphors about his sacrifice, and people didn't understand yet that he had to die to pay the penalty for their sins. So they were confused. Another problem was his choice of metaphor, right? I mean, eating flesh, drinking blood, that would be offensive to us today, and it was just as offensive back then. Plus, for the Jews, it was against their law to even drink the blood of animals or to eat flesh with the blood not yet drained from it. 
So for them, this was an extra offensive metaphor. So why did Jesus use the metaphor? Well, first, blood was already associated with sacrificial death. Blood had to be shed for the animal sacrifices which temporarily atoned, that is, temporarily appeased God's wrath over sin. So this symbolism could have helped people understand that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for them if they could have gotten past their preconceptions about Him and their objections to the metaphor. And second, remember, this whole dialogue started when Jesus miraculously fed people bread which reminded them of Moses and the manna, so they started wanting more physical blessings from Jesus' miracles to prove He was greater than Moses. That's when Jesus started telling them to seek eternal bread, which only He could give them. So now the question is, will Jesus try to comfort His disciples? Did I miss one? I did not. He asks if his teaching causes them to be offended. And knowing that it does, he asks what will happen when they see him ascend to heaven. In verse 61, Jesus uses the verb scandalizo, all right, scandalize, which can, it can mean in Greek that I cause you to sin, but here it means I offend or I shock. The disciples are offended. They are shocked by Jesus' teaching. But if the teaching so far is a problem, what if it all comes true? The only way for Jesus to end His mission here on earth and ascend back to heaven to be with the Father is to go through with His death on the cross. If they were offended by His teaching about this, how would they react when He went through with it? Would they be even more scandalized? They don't understand that Jesus has to die so that they can live. They wouldn't understand that He could be the Messiah Savior sent from God who is someday to deliver Israel, and yet He would allow Himself to die the lowest form of death in that culture. If He is God, then why would He be sacrificed? This is very hard to understand. It sounds crazy. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, but we preach about a crucified Christ, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Stumbling block there is the Greek word scandalon, scandal. That's why we call it the scandal of the cross. Verse 63, Jesus still talking to His disciples. He says, the Spirit is the one who gives life. Human nature is of no help. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had already known from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. So Jesus added, Because of this I told you that no one can come to Me unless the Father has allowed Him to come. After this, many of His disciples quit following Him and did not accompany Him any longer. Jesus did not comfort His disciples. Instead of softening his message, he raised the bar on following him. And as a result, many left. Now, these disciples were people who had been following Jesus around and accepting his teaching, but they were not yet true believers in Jesus' identity or in the salvation that he could offer. And here we see them reject this new teaching, and thus they stop following for them, the offense of His words outweighed the excitement of the miracles. Such is how obstinate unfaith can be. Jesus knows that they're offended. They're scandalized by His teaching. But He indicates what we have already learned, that they cannot come to saving faith on their own. It is the Holy Spirit who gives life, who regenerates people spiritually so that they believe in the gospel of Jesus the Christ. We have learned in this gospel that Jesus was the bearer of the Holy Spirit during His ministry. And to Jesus, God the Father granted the right to give life. Jesus offers words that are spirit and life in that they're the product of the life-giving spirit and they are the means of giving life to those who believe. This 
is the pivotal point in every person's destiny. How will they react to Jesus and his gospel message? Will they come and believe? Or will they draw back and turn away? Jesus knew people would reject him. And it would always be so. He shares these truths about how people are saved so that those of us who do believe can better understand and withstand the attacks of those who do not. In that sense, this is designed to build up believers today, to encourage us by understanding that we were chosen and to embolden us to defend our faith against those who are thus, so far anyway, unenlightened. Notice that Jesus, as the divine Son of God, already knows who will believe and who will not. And he knows not only that his sacrifice is coming, but exactly who it is that will hand him over to the authorities who send him to the cross. Let's finish our text. There's a lot to absorb in this sermon, I know. So Jesus said to the twelve, You don't want to go away too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, Didn't I choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is the devil? Now he said this about Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, for Judas, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. In the Greek text, the way Jesus formed his first question indicates that he expected their answer to be no. They didn't want to go. This was a time of sorting out the true believers from those who were just hanging on for fun. Now, the twelve probably didn't like Jesus' teaching either, and no doubt they were upset that he drove away so many of his followers. That was no way to build a ministry or start a revolution, right? But Jesus chose them specifically. And they believe by now that he is all that John has revealed Jesus to be thus far in this gospel, which they summarize by calling him the Holy One of God. And that he has the words of eternal life, the true gospel. Well, 11 of them believe this anyway. The other one, Judas Iscariot, would later hand Jesus over to the authorities and start the legal process that will result in Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus refers to Judas here as the devil. Now, your Bible might say a devil. That's a little softening interpretive thing that they do. There's only one devil. Jesus called Peter Satan when Peter was trying to dissuade Jesus from going to his death. And here Jesus thinks of Judas as the devil for setting that death in motion. Both men were in that moment trying to do Satan's, the devil's, work. Satan means adversary, and when Peter was acting adverse to God's purposes, Jesus called him Satan. The word we translate as devil is diablos, which means slanderer. Judas would slander Jesus to the authorities as he did the devil's work, so Jesus refers to him here as the devil. If God chooses you to be one of his people, you will come to faith in Jesus as your Savior. That means you will continuously depend on Jesus for your salvation. Through his death and resurrection, you will believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God and that he came here to be the promised human Messiah, Savior, the one we call Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus in this way, then you will remain in close relationship to him. He will be the bread that will sustain you for eternal life and so you can be assured, as we saw last time, that your salvation is guaranteed. That you will go to heaven when you die. And that someday Jesus will resurrect you to physical life on a new earth. But this relationship with Jesus is not just about having your future guaranteed. It's about being intimate with him forever, but starting now. It's about depending on Jesus every moment, not just so your relationship with God is peaceful, not just so you can have forgiveness, but for empowerment 
empowerment so that you can courageously and openly face your doubts and your fears. Empowerment so you can be bold in sharing God's truth in love. Empowerment so that you can be gentle and kind even when people are mocking you. Empowerment so that you can learn to live in freedom from your lusts, your addictions, your bondages, your bad habits. Empowerment so that you can overcome your flaws, so that you can learn to develop your gifts and strengths and use them for God's good purposes. This relationship also is about being devoted to Jesus every moment. Not just acknowledging Him as Savior or King in your mind, but actually doing the things He commands followers to do, such as serving in the ministry and building spiritual relationships with those who don't yet know Him. It's about actually learning to live more selflessly, giving more of your money, more of your time, more of your energy, more of your will and your desire to serve Christ and thus to bless others. And perhaps most importantly, it's about learning to walk with Him, not just in obedience, but in intimacy, to be in His protective love, to commune with Him, to talk to Him, to be taught by Him. The goal of this church is to help every one of you grow to be a mature, multiplying disciple of Jesus Christ. We want you to be healthy and strong and growing spiritually so you can enjoy true life with Christ, so you can experience the exhilaration of having Christ work through you to bless someone else, to bring someone else to faith. So you can influence people for Christ in your family, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your workplace, in our whole community. That's why we come together on Sunday. We want to worship. And most, we have church so that we can grow you to be what God has designed you to be. Jesus is offering that. And I hope these sermons alternating between Jesus' teaching and the teaching about spiritual growth will help us get there. Let's pray again. God, we thank you. Even it is, a, it is a challenging teaching. Nobody wants to think of eating Jesus or drinking his blood. But thank you that he shows us what it means. We accept his sacrifice for us. Lord, we believe in who Jesus is, that he is the Son, the divine Son. And that he came here and took on flesh in part so that he could die for us. And that by choosing to believe, to continuously believe, to overcome our doubts, our fears, any other impulses we have from the flesh or hesitations from our culture, by putting our faith in him and in him alone, then we reside in him and he resides in us and we can have eternal life. Wow. Thank you for that. We pray, God, that you would use us. If you have chosen us and made us yours, then please transform us. Renew our minds, transform our characters, help us change our lifestyles to match up with yours. Help us to be your ambassadors. Help us be so Christ-like that we glow and people want to know, where'd that come from? We pray you'll use us to bless each other, to grow each other, but also to reach out to the lost so that everyone has the opportunity to hear the gospel. And whether we believe in election or not, that is what you call us to do. So we pray you embolden us and help us be intentional and help us be selfless and that you would bless us with fruitfulness so we could rejoice as people come to faith and experience what you have to offer. Amen.